All right, let's look at review sheet number two. Review sheet number two. Number one, under match, 1 Corinthians, F. It's the love chapter. Though I speak in the speech of men and angels, I have not love. I'm just making noise. I'm just making noise. Number two, this is God's world, I, and it is good. There's nothing wrong with God's world. It's that we have messed it up. It is good. Number three, the creator is magnified, H, more than the creation. We want God to be the creator and the emphasis on the, the creator, not just the creation. Number four, God's presence, C, Always, always. Number five, Psalm 24, J, the creation chapter. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods. It's the creation chapter. Number six, God's holiness, G, is our sanctification. We seek to be like him in holiness, and that is our sanctification. All power, A, is given to Jesus. And Jesus said what to the church? Now you take this power and go into all of the world and make disciples. So all of the power that Jesus had when he was on earth, we can have as the body of Christ in the world today. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Now you take the power and go into all the world as the body of Christ. Number eight, creation. B, it's God's revelation to man. Creation. God's revelation to man. Number nine, God's knowledge, E, omniscience, omniscience, God's knowledge. Number 10, the power of God, D, it is not just sheer force lift to its highest level. There will be no virtue in that whatsoever. Can God make a rock so big he can't, he can't move it? Why would he want to? God does that which ought to be done within his power. All right, any questions about the matching? All right, number next, at least three points of God's love. Now, I'm just going to give you the three that I jotted down. You may have, have different ones in your notes that you jotted down. All doctrine is an explanation of God's love. Now, that's going to sound strange when I come to talk about the wrath of God in just a few moments. All doctrine is an explanation of God's love. Number two, God creates out of and for love. He creates out of love and he creates for love, which simply means he loves us, I love you. And I really, I really do. Some of you more than others, but I, I, you know how that goes. We all love at the same level. We just enjoy each other, some more than others. Some folks won't let you really love them like you would like to. Strange. Number three, love is anchored to Jesus. Love is anchored to to Jesus. Now you may have others than that. Look at your notes. Number three, short definitions. Derived holiness. Any holiness that you do is derived from the holiness of God. Let me say that again. 
any holiness that you have is derived from the holiness of God. Man by nature is not holy, just the opposite. Man by nature can be a scoundrel by nature. So it is by the holiness of God that we become like him. That's our sanctification. Holiness and righteousness, God's innermost nature. God's innermost nature. By the way, holiness and righteousness, you may just want to jot down. It also appeals and repels. Some folks don't want to get that close to God. They sound strange, but it's true. By their action, they don't want to get that close to God. They're repelled. Somebody's going to call me a Jesus freak. Somebody's going to call me a fanatic. But listen, you know what fanatic, the fan is the word for fanatic. I am a fan of the Jaguars. I'm a fan of whatever team. I'm a fan of, I, I'm a fanatic about them. Do you know? Oh, I'm going to meddle. Some people pay more for tickets to sporting events than they give to the church. Uh-oh, yeah. That's true. I, I know that's true. And some of those folks are, quote, leaders in the church. Let me see if I can say it like I want to say it. If you do not use your resources to support the gospel to all of the earth, you have violated what God asks us to do. That's pure and simple. Let me say that again. If you do not use some of your resources to support the ministry that takes the gospel to the whole world, which is the church, the denomination doesn't take the gospel to the whole world. The church takes the gospel. And if you don't use some of your resources to support that, you have violated what God asked us to do, go into all the world. Uh, preacher, I'm a tither. 10%, at least 10% of everything I've ever earned since the second Sunday I was saved. I have been faithful to the tithe and the offering. Now, are you bragging? Yes. Yes, I am. I am glad I've seen. I've been, I have been fortunate enough to preach on five of the continents in the world. And I can tell you, every place I've been, I went to Singapore, cleanest city I've ever seen in my life, and preached a revival in a hotel for a preacher friend of mine who was a missionary. Singapore was his home base. Listen, wherever the gospel is preached, the church is there preaching the gospel or supporting those who are preaching the gospel. That's your sermon for today. Let me get off that. Revealed, attracts and repels. Redemption is revealed in Jesus Christ. If you want to know the God of the Old Testament, study the Jesus of the New Testament. If you want to know the God of the Old Testament, study Jesus of the New Testament. You do not study the New Testament as much in the light of the Old as you do the Old Testament in the light of the New. The New Testament. The New Jerusalem. All of this. All right. It's revealed in Christ. Number four, God's knowledge is an immediate knowledge, not an accumulated experiential knowledge. It's an immediate knowledge. God's almighty power 
to do everything that ought to be done. Everything that ought to be done. All right. Any repeats on those? I hope not. Now, I want to take just a few minutes before we jump into the doctrine or the, the great biblical truth of man. I want to talk to you about the wrath of God. And that's, that's hard to do. The wrath of God is God's, what I call, God's foreign nature. It is not his innermost nature. His innermost nature is love. The question kept coming to me as I studied this and restudied it again. Can you have love without having some wrath to go along with that love? And wrath is a, a harsh word. The wrath of God is so much different than the anger of man. I, I'll tell you how different it is in, in my study, in my understanding of Scripture. The wrath of God is so far above the anger of man as agape love is above erotic love. The wrath of God is God's foreign nature. But it is real. It is real. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure that you could ever have complete love without having some venue of wrath that goes along with it. For instance, your children. My granddaughter just did a special thing, and I got my book just one day late. I was supposed to get it on Father's Day. Have you ever heard the uh, story worth? Story, yeah, story worth. Well, she wanted me to do a story worth. And she did all the questions. Uh, Ramona did all the work in typing it up. And uh, she sent me the little book about this. One thing I said in the book, my mother taught me what wrath is all about. She was a strict disciplinarian. Strict. I mean, we didn't get by with it. Uh, mother always had the reach on us, and she outweighed us. So we listened, or we got a spanking. I believe, this is going to horrify some people, I believe in spanking. I never ask my children, is it okay when, your grand, when the grandchild behaves if I correct the grandchild, maybe with a swat? I never ask them. I just assume that they know that's what I'm going to do because that's what I did with them. My children used to say, how in the world did you know? How did you know we did that? I said, listen, everybody wants to blame the preacher's kids with something. So I just take him at face value and believe that you really did that. But dad, I said, no, no, don't. Now, don't try to lie your way out of it. That only precipitates it further and makes it more. My mother used to say, now, I want you to know this is going to hurt me, but not as badly as it's going to hurt you. She wanted us to know that. Now, if you're not a spanking person, if you're a Dr. Spock person or whatever that might be, I, I want you to know that I believe God says at times, and it's going to come more and more, God says, that's enough. I had a friend, one of the best friends I ever had. I thought one of my best friends who did some things that were absolutely, deacon in the church, did some things that were absolutely contrary and contradictory to everything he believed and that I believed. That went on for maybe a year. They found him one morning 
parked in his truck on the parking lot of a business, dead. So one asked me, what happened? I said, you're asking me, I can tell you what I think happened. God said, Bill, that's enough. I'm not going to let you run the testimony any longer. That's enough. Now, God has a nature that is love. And part of that nature includes his wrath. Now, if you don't believe this is too, true, read chapters 19 through 22 of the book of Revelation. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. Well, listen, people say to me, do you think the coming of Christ is near? Oh, listen, it's going to get so much worse than anything we have ever seen. And then the, lion, the lamb becomes the lion. He, his wrath is poured out upon the world. Read Revelation. The wrath of God. C.H. Dodd says, It is the inevitable process of cause and effect in the moral order of the universe. Cause and effect. New Testament. It's more than just working out moral consequences. God actually has wrath revealed in Scripture as clearly as love. But it's always, underscore this, his wrath is always revealed in the context of grace and redemption. Always. All right, that's all I'm going to say about the wrath of God. I don't want to overdose on it. I want us to turn now the second great truth that we're going to talk about, and that's the doctrine of man. It's a surprising thing to me how many people, how many theologians, how many commentators, biblical scholars, believe that the most important doctrine of the day is the doctrine of man. Now, in some ways, I think that may be true because in the doctrine of man, you have to identify the sanctity of life. And we in the states, in the United States of America, have and are rapidly even more losing the dignity of life. Life doesn't have much meaning. I don't understand. I, I just confess to you, I've been doing this a long time. I've been around the world and halfway into Kentucky. <laughs> I, 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 I'm just telling you. I don't understand people walking into a place and shooting individuals just because they want to. I don't understand why they don't understand the dignity of life. There is something about life. God created you for life. Even gave Jesus so that you will not die when this body dies. That's how important it is to God. I don't understand it. I, I saw this thing in Chicago where they just walked into a mall, walked into a meeting, and started shooting people. Now, you can call it gun control if you want to. It's not gun control. It's evil control that we need to be about. There is, there is nothing you can say about these shootings that is not evil. Nothing. When you gun down a four-year-old and a six-year-old who have never had a chance, there's nothing but evil in all of that. So we, we need to look for evil control, not for gun control. I wish some politicians would understand that. I wish they would understand it. Well, I'll get off of that. The doctrine of man, many believe, is the most crucial doctrine of our time because we are losing in our society the dignity of life. Abortion, 
is a reality. No matter how much we try to curb it, it still hangs around and is still going to exist. Now, you just watch, and I've watched it. Did a paper on it early in my graduate education. Euthanasia, which means when you get so old and you're no longer productive, they're going to let you die. Not only are they going to let you die, they'll help you. They'll help you die. Euthanasia is becoming more and more a reality in life. So, there you go. All right. Yes. Yeah, well, and that's, that's one of the things about abortion. I don't understand. Let the baby be born and somebody take care of it. Adoption is a good option. Hey, I think I'll write that down. Adoption is a good option. Yeah. So, now I want to talk about the paradoxical nature of man. Paradoxical nature of man. That's the best way I can say it. And here's why it's paradoxical. Here's man with the nature that he is so bad he can commit such atrocities. But he's so good that Christ died for him. That's paradoxical. From the cross, Jesus said, forgive them. They know not what they do. It's paradoxical. So bad, he dies for me because I'm so worth to God that he died for me. Killed him. Now, this paradoxical nature of man. In the garden, he's weak. He's small. He's sinful. But I remind you, he is in the garden. Not only is he in the garden, he is the prime. He is the most essential. He is God's creation above all of the other creation. God breathed in him life. He became a living soul. So we are sinful, man is capable of, of creating all kind of atrocity, but even though we are sinful, we're so good that God wants to save us. That's the paradoxical nation of man. I should say, worthless, valuable. Worthless, valuable is man. Now, the only way we can define man and have a doctrine of man or a great biblical truth of man is as we look back. And when we look back and try to reconstruct man from the beginning in the garden to where we are today, when we try to construct a, a great biblical truth about man, we have to look through the eyes of fallen man. He was in the garden, but he did fall. Man created his own problems because God gave him choice. He gave him a will. So the, we're going to try to define this doctrine. I jotted myself a note to say to you, to say biblically we must base our doctrine only in what we know about man. We can't base it. Well, if man had not sinned, well, that's moot. He did. You can't do that. Man sinned. Now, here's the definition I want us to look at. Man has intellect, he has will, and he's created for fellowship and responsibility. He has intellect, he has will, he's created for fellowship 
and responsibility. And the two go together. He is a personal being. Interestingly enough, God makes us so personal that you, if you have ten fingers, you don't even have a fingerprint that's like on your hands, much less like anyone else's that we've ever discovered in the whole world. You are that personal, that personal to God, that personal. Now, you know, if I had my whiteboard up here, which I don't, I would say to you there are three basic personal relationships in life. And all three of these basic personal relationships must be cultivated if they're going to become all that God wants them to be and all that you need them to be. Number one, every person in the world has a relationship to God. Every person. Whether they are saved or lost, they have a relationship to God. Now, the lost man's relationship is just that, is lost. He doesn't understand when I stand up and say to you, by the grace of God, God healed him, made him well. I believe that God is the ultimate one who heals. He is still the great physician. I believe that with all of the medical advice, all the medical techniques, all that can be done to the human body, how many pills you can take. I, I don't know how many pills I have to take just to stay going. No problem with me. I get up and swallow them all at one time. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, all of that's good and wonderful, and there's still discovery. By the way, everything that's discovered was already there. You can't discover this. You can't discover something that hasn't been there all the time. When they discovered penicillin, it's been there all the time. When they discover Whatever it is, it's been there all the time. And they're discovering more and more and more and more. Uh, I have a, a son-in-law who's been having some fainting spells. Not bad. But his work, he doesn't need to have fainting spells. You know what? They're going to, they found something in his brain. They haven't been able to define all of it. But they're going to shoot him with a needle into that area of the brain. I didn't even know they could do that. I didn't know you could get a needle. So maybe they're going up through here. I, I have no idea. But they're telling him, we really think this is the cure for what you have. And one shot is supposed to do it. It used to be we'd just put him in a nursing home. So, man has a personal relationship with God. Lost man, judgment. Saved man, judgment. Relation to God. Second, every man and woman, every human being has a personal relationship to themselves. You are a person. I am a person. Agree with me. Disagree with me. Fuss at me. Whatever. Don't ignore me. I am a person. And you cannot ignore a person. So this personal relationship with who you are. Now one of the problems we have in life, if we're not careful, is that we'll want to be somebody else. We'll want to be somebody else. I, I thank God, in, as well as I can remember, I've never wanted to be anything but me because being somebody else would be an imitation. I'm the real me. I'm the only real me alive in the world today, and some people say, amen, I'm glad about that. But I have a personal relationship with myself. I know me. I know me far better than you know me. Nancy knew me far better than you know me. But I know me. I know 
where I am vulnerable, I know where I'm strong. There's some things I don't do anymore because I developed a conviction a long time ago. I'm not going to do this, and I'm not going to do that, and I'm not going to do that. I don't smoke, I don't chew, and I don't run with those who do. <laughs> There's some things you just break as habits in your life. In the little book I was telling you about earlier, about my granddaughter, one of the questions was about what habits have you broken? Well, I had a couple of bad habits when I was lost. Just bad habits. And God, one of them became a spiritual conviction. The other became an economic decision. I decided I couldn't do this and give a tithe, so I opted to give the tithe and do away with the bad habit. Now, you think I'm going to tell you what it was, but I'm not going to tell you what it was. <laughs> so you go out here and say, did you know the preacher used to? <laughs> it's not what you used to do. It's, it's who you are. So you have a personal relationship to yourself, to yourself. And some of you allow that personal relationship for the next, a personal relationship to others. A personal relationship to others. Now, when you say the personal relationship to others, you have to qualify that. Your spouse is the most intimate relationship you will ever have in life. Your spouse. Now, when you know that and understand that, and it becomes a reality in your life, then you know the second most personal relationship your children. Now, don't ever put your children before your spouse. Don't ever put your children before your spouse. There is a temptation to do that, and it should never happen. And so our children, and I don't know about you, but you have a different relationship to each child. Is it my two girls are as different as daylight and dark. We talk about different things on the telephone. They're just different. Both wonderful, moral, good, making a contribution to society. They're just good folks. So you have a personal relationship to your children with each child. Don't make it across the board. You love them all, but you don't relate to them in the same way at all times. My baby daughter, you could spank her until the sun shines. She'd never cry one tear. Not much use spanking if you're not going to cry. But retract her privilege of talking on the telephone, she'd go berserk. No, it's the sometimes it's the retraction of privilege. But you have to know which child you're dealing with. Personal relationship. Now spread that out just a little further. When you get married, this may surprise some of you. When you get married, you marry the whole family. <laughs> True? Ooh, Nancy's family was so good to me. Her mother was my greatest cheerleader when I was told them I was going to be a preacher. She said, that's the most wonderful thing I've heard. The rest of them were saying, I don't think he'll ever make it. <laughs> he didn't know enough to come in out of the rain. She was my cheerleader. You can do it. And she did things. She was a manager of a dress shop. And just every now and then, unannounced, she'd send Nancy a new dress or a new sweater. And she just was an encourager. Now, Nancy's dad was a fine man, but he couldn't carry the candle when it came to encouragement that Lola could have. So you marry the whole family, and sometimes that's tough. 
especially mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. Amen to that one, somebody said. Yeah. Listen. Yeah, uh, listen. And it, it spans generations. So you have person. I'll get off of that. You have personal relationships, and then it goes down to acquaintances. Just some people you're acquainted with. Basically, I'm acquainted with all of you. I have a relationship to all of you as a teacher. But this relationship I have with others. For instance, someone said to me, if you could talk to one person who's still alive, he was at that time, and sit down and have fellowship with him, who would it be? I'd say I'd love to talk to Billy Graham. I'd just love to sit down and talk to him. I always admired the fact that when he preached, he preached. Knew how to give an invitation better than anybody I've ever seen in my life. I'd love to. Did I know Billy Graham? Met him twice. Basically shook hands with him both times. Told him I admired him. Met him at Southwestern Seminary. Met him on the platform at Southern Baptist Convention. Just in passing. Did I have a personal relationship with Billy? No. No. I would like to have had, but I didn't. So, all of that to say, you are a personal being and you have personal relationships. Personal relationships with others. Secondly, our next man is a created being. He is a created being. Now, what does it mean when it says man was created in the image of God? Well, it doesn't mean that God looks like us. It doesn't mean that God has a body. It's talking about the moral aspect, the religious aspect, God's image. At least no room for pride on our part. We're created. Do you know what we're created from? Dust. It's like a little boy that looked under the bed. He'd had a Sunday school lesson on man created from dust. He looked under the bed and said, Mama, somebody's coming or going. <laughs> We're created from dust. There's not much use for dust. How could we have elevated pride when we know what we're created from? It's created but in the image of God. Our death became because of sin. And our life will come because of salvation in Christ. One of my favorite places in the Bible is the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And the last part of that, I believe it starts about verse 51, 52. Paul writes to the church and says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. And so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought the past, the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul lays that theology down to where you can't miss it. You know exactly what he's talking about. 
But do you know Paul's going to where for you or there for you somewhere? So he there for us. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Isn't it a wonderful thing to know? The least little thing I do out of the right motive is noticeable by God. Noticeable by God. Nothing else is. Now, let me be candid. And some of you are not going to like this, but that's okay. You'll get over it. Some people think more of their club than they do of their church. Any club. <laughs> Any club. I've known folks in my church who would do makeup meetings for their club and wouldn't even make up their offering when they came back to church for the Sunday they missed. Listen, get your priorities straight. You're made from dust. And your only hope in that dust is that God loves you so much he gave you Jesus Christ that you might be saved. So man is a paradoxical individual, a paradoxical person. Paradoxical in that he is so bad he can create the worst kind of hostility, but so good, so valuable, the crown of God's creation, so valuable that Jesus died for him. That's where you are. All right, next time I'm going to deal with the doctrine of sin. Now, we won't get through the doctrine of sin as quickly because I know more about that than I do the doctrine of man. All right, thank you for being here on this wet, soggy, rainy. I'm about tired of the rain. I saw two ducks getting in a boat. <laughs> I, I'm just about tired of the rain. It's about time to stop. Okay, Ed, how many do we have today? 97. 97. Yeah. I thought if we had nine, we'd be in good shape. Thank you for being here. I mean that with all of my heart. Thank you that Tuesday Bible study means that much to you to get out in this kind of weather.